So grateful for what God has begun in this place. Welcome to Powerhouse Church. Thank you guys for being here on such a warm Sunday. But we know that God is in the midst of doing something awesome and special in all of our lives. And we're just so grateful for what God started here about 10 months ago. Well, last week we kicked off a brand new series entitled Jonah. Jonah would be one of God's prophets who he was calling to go into this Gentile nation to preach to them. But Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah had some reservations to what God was calling him to do. See, God had raised up prophets who would communicate his will, communicate his vision, and to really be God's mouthpiece for what God wanted them to do. And so in all those that God was the God of the Israelites, God also is the God of all the people he created. So although God's focus, uh, and we look in the Old Testament, was mainly on the Jewish nation, God had his eyes and his hearts also on other nations. And so God wanted his servant to go and preach to this nation. Now, one of the things about the Ninevites is that they were an evil people, that they were known for capturing people and torturing them and, and killing them. And one of the things was is that they were an enemy to Israel, that they had these issues with Israel, and Israel didn't like them. And so Jonah didn't want to go. As this Assyrian Empire city, which was Nineveh, was this place where all kind of debauchery was going on. And so Jonah didn't want to go. But how can God have a preacher and a prophet who's disobedient? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. But in this story, it's really great. And what I want you to see as we kind of journey back to a little bit from last week is there's a Jonah in all of us. That God has spoken to each of us by his word. But some of the things in his words we don't want to abide by. That we choose to kind of go in the other direction. Last week we talked about how we get into these situations where, like Southwest Airlines, we want to get away. That that was Jonah when God gave him his directions to go to Nineveh. And as God's prophet heard these words from God, he did something interesting. He did not only not obey God, he decided to go in the exact different direction. Jonah chapter 1 verse 3 says, But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. The opposite way. There's two reasons I believe that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Number one, they were wicked and violent people who showed their enemies no mercy. Again, as they were well known for torturing and killing their enemies. Number two, I believe another reason why Jonah didn't want to go was because he felt like they deserved God's wrath. That he thought that if he went to Joppa, if he went to Nineveh, that they might actually hear his words and heed them and turn to God. And so Jonah was like, these people are evil. I don't want to see them get saved. God, give them your wrath. And because you're calling me to go to preach to them, God, I'm going in the opposite direction. Well, if we're honest, we all know some Ninevites whom we feel don't deserve God's mercy. But we have to remember that we didn't deserve it either. If God could love the unlovable in us, his grace and mercy should motivate us to love the unlovable in others. Or do you love the people who even despise you? Because if you're loving those who love you, sinners do that. You're not proving anything. Well, in the heat of the moment, whether it was fear or just being rebellious, Jonah must have forgotten that God is omnipresent. This means that it is impossible to truly run away from God because God is everywhere. But this fact didn't stop Jonah. And if we're honest, it doesn't stop us either. That in our own ways, we too try to run away from God. 
Last week, we learned that when our emotions and feelings dictate our actions, we can easily forsake God's word and just like Jonah, find ourselves on the run. See, ultimately, Jonah ran because he probably didn't like God's plan. But by choosing to run, Jonah was not only being disobedient, Jonah was breaking fellowship and intimacy with God. See, we learned last week that God's will for our lives is always best for us, even if it doesn't sound like it, and even if we don't feel like doing it. Because rebellion and disobedience against God's will leads to a wilderness experience where God is forced to discipline us, which ends up costing us time, peace, joy, and money. Well, Jonah would learn his lesson the hard way that you can't run from God, and there are consequences when you do. And God lets Jonah know exactly what those consequences are in verse 4. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. See, church, when we're running from God, he knows exactly how to get our attention. God knows that it will take adverse actions and negative circumstances to get our attention. Often I say if God could change us with the birds singing and the sun shining, he would do it. But God knows that he needs to bring trouble into our lives so that he can get our attention. And Jonah would be no different. We learned last week that sin will take you farther than you're willing to go, and it will make you pay a price greater than you're willing to pay. I think I need to say that one more time. Sin will take you farther then you're willing to go, and it will make you pay a price greater than you're willing to pay. God is everywhere. However, we can run from his presence, and we can run from his will. We do this when we choose to be disobedient to God and his word. Well, we ended our last time when the sailors finally threw Jonah into the sea. And today we're going to pick up our story right there as God continues to get Jonah's undivided attention. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your word. God, we thank you for this true story, Lord, of Jonah. That, God, that's a Jonah in all of us. That all of us in some way, God, we, we turn and go the opposite direction of where you're calling us to go. So, Father, I just pray as we preach your word, God, that you would show us ourselves in this story. And that, God, that we would repent, that we would turn back to you in a way, God, that glorifies you. So, Father, I just pray right now that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit wants to say to us today, Lord. That we will be transformed and changed by your word as we submit, God, and as we listen today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of our message today is A Come to Jesus Moment. A Come to Jesus to Jesus moment. See, God's greatest desire for his children is for them to walk in obedience. And at times, we can always find ourselves justifying the decisions and choices that we make because it goes with our own feeling and understanding. Basically, we can justify what we want to do, even if we know what we want to do is against what God has said. We all face this. Every single day, we have choices to make. Am I going to be obedient to God, or am I just going to do me? Because this is how I'm feeling. This is what I want to do. This is what my flesh is crying out to do. This is why God's word tells us to crucify this flesh every single day and walk in the spirit so that we can walk in obedience to God. Because like sheep, we all go astray in our lives. And as we see God's very own prophet was going astray. I mean, think about it. He blatantly disobeyed God. But God loves his children so much that he gives the disobedience his divine correction. Listen to Hebrews 12, 6. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Because God loves us so much, each of us are subject to his discipline and punishment. When I thought about punishment, it sounds harsh and it can sound unfair. But we all know the correction that we received as a child. 
but it actually helped our lives. And us as parents today, we give discipline to our children. So why should we expect something different from our Heavenly Father? Why shouldn't we expect discipline from Him when we choose to walk in disobedience? In fact, if a parent chooses not to discipline and correct their child, did you know that they actually hate them? Listen to Proverbs 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. So God is calling us, even as parents, to discipline our children. But God is calling us to accept his discipline. Because on the front end, it is painful. But it's producing something. And so God wants us to endure that as he disciplines us so he can correct us. Every mature Christian has been spiritually spanked by God. And that spanking has become a catalyst to making them more like Jesus. So don't despise the chastening of the Lord. It's designed to break you so that God can make you. See, no one likes discipline because it's not fun, because it brings forth a negative emotion. But God knows something. God knows that although it hurts, it's exactly what we need. This truth is found in Hebrews 12:11. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. It's been thrown into this raging sea, and the storm ceased and was calm. This was really amazing because there was this raging sea that I think when Jonah was saying, throw me in the sea, he was thinking, you know what, I don't even want to live anymore. But for me, I don't want to go preach to these Ninevites. I'd rather die. And so they cast him into the raging sea. And as soon as they did, the sea was calm. As Jonah was still walking in disobedience, I just believe there was two reasons why the storm stopped. Number one, so that Jonah didn't drown. Because God was still going to use him in a powerful way. But number two... It was for these new believers. See, last week we talked about how these pagan sailors start fearing God when they saw God's power. And they actually began praying to him and offering sacrifices to him. So I think God did it for the second reason was for their benefit. But Jonah was still unwilling to submit to God, choosing death instead of obeying what God has called them to do. Jonah didn't know this, but the raging waters was just a warm-up act for God. As Jonah was about to experience and receive from the hand of God discipline and correction for his disobedience. Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. When we're running from obedience, God will send adverse circumstances that will swallow us up so that he can get our attention. Think about this. The wind obeyed God. The sea obeyed God. The fish obeyed God. But God's prophet and preacher was still being disobedient. He still needed some more convincing. Jonah needed a come-to-Jesus moment. And this great fish that God had assigned was obliged to do God's will. And I just, I'm going to just tell you my definition that I created for a come to Jesus moment. It's when God goes into a full court press into your life that gets your complete undivided attention by whatever means necessary. Until you see the error of your ways and you gain a new respect and fear of God that leads you to repent Turn from your sins and turn back to God in complete obedience. For Jonah, for Jonah this would be three days and three, three nights days inside the stomach of a great fish. I mean, fish. as I was thinking about this, so this I want you to try to get a Jonah of what it would be darkness. like to be inside of a great it fish. It put him on a three-day fast. One of the things this did, it, it trapped him so he couldn't Jonah try to run away from God darkness. anymore. It made him evaluate his life and where it was going. It put him on a three-day fast. And finally, well, voluntary most or involuntary, it made him it trapped him so that he couldn't run away from God anymore. 
What was Jonah's It made him evaluate his life to and his where come was going to Jesus moment. And finally, it made him it was prayer the Lord. Jonah chapter what 2 What was verse Jonah's one. response to his come to Jesus moment? I mean, did Jonah complain? Did he say, God, what, what is going on? Jonah's response was prayer. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Reveal to Jonah that God has spared his life. That he knew that God could have let him die when he went into the water. See, in this process of his come to Jesus moment, he went from being a man of rebellion and disobedience to a man of prayer and thanksgiving. Unfortunately, like Jonah, we won't get right with God until we are swallowed up by life's adverse and negative circumstances and situations so he can get our attention. And if you think about it, previously Jonah was pouting, refusing to do what God was commanding him to do. This is because God, Jonah had a hardened heart. And this hardened heart was a product of a self-centered and a self-focused life. Jonah was thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking there's all these people who, who need the gospel, who need to, to turn from their sins and get saved. Jonah was concerned about his own personal feelings. He's like, no, I don't want them saved. They deserve God's wrath. Is your life more self-centered or is it more God-centered? See, the gospel of Jesus Christ that changed your life also is supposed to change your perspective. It's to take you from being this self-centered person to being God-centered. Saying, God, your will be done. God, I want to be a conduit to, to change the world in Jesus' name. Or you still think that it's all about you. That's one of the issues in the body of Christ today is that Christians still think it's all about them. That it's not about forwarding of God's kingdom agenda, but it's about them. It's about how they feel. It's about what they want. But God is calling us to lay down our lives the way Jesus laid down his lives for us. To pick up this cross and follow him in all that we say and all that we do. Ultimately, God wants us to be broken and remain broken before him. Listen to this psalm of David. And David was this man after God's own heart in Psalms 51. It says, the sacrifice that you desire is a broken spirit. That you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. See, we all sin and fall short of God's perfect standard of righteousness. But a casual relationship with sin, which is really us walking in willful sins, it means that we don't have an authentic worship of God. But true worship, true worship to God is through the pathway of holy obeying him. So that when we come to him with true repentance, we will have a humbled heart that's broken over our personal sin. Are you broken when you fail God? Does it hurt you when you disappoint him? When you choose to do something that you know that's contrary to his word? Do you think about the price that was paid for your sins? Or do you just casually walk in and say, God knows my heart? This is a typical phrase in the Christian community, God knows my heart. And I say, God knows what you do. That's what God knows. But if we remain broken before him, then we will have this true worship of God where we're honoring him in all that we do. And what happens is, is our outlook becomes God-centered and it becomes God-focused. Well, Jonah continued his prayer in verse 3. He says, you threw me in the ocean depths and I sank down to the heart of the sea that the mighty waters engulfed me and I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. 
See, ultimately, it wasn't the soldiers, I mean, the sailors that tossed Jonah into the sea, but it was God. Jonah was finally able to recognize and see God's hand on everything that was happening. And now, finally, it's, it appeared to him that God was trying to get his attention, that it was God that was giving him a come-to-Jesus moment so that he could change, that it was by God's grace that he was rescued from the waters that could have drowned him. Jonah was recognizing that it was his willful disobedience that was taking him out of fellowship and intimacy with God. But at this moment, during his come to Jesus moment, he began praying. He began worshiping. His heart began turning back to God because he was praying towards God's holy temple. See, when we have uninterrupted quiet time with God, we will be amazed of the revelation that God can give us. Jonah had some quiet time with God. Think about it. He's in total darkness. In his mind, he's thinking that this fish just ate him, but he's still alive. But in the midst of this quiet time, he knew God was at work. He knew that God could hear his prayers, so he continued to pray. He had this quiet time to meditate and to ponder the goodness of God. I mean, he had nothing else to do. He could have complained. He could have did these other things. But because he was God's prophet, because he knew God, he knew that he could turn back to God. See, if we're honest, we find ourselves saying things like, I don't have time to pray. I'm too busy. I got to go. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to go to church. But I'm going to tell you this. What you're really saying is, God, you're not a priority to me. You're not a priority to me until I get in the jam and I need you to show up. Otherwise, God, I'll see you when I see you. But God wants us to know that we all have the same 24 hours, and we will always make time for what's important. One of our problems is, is we forget the goodness of God. Have you forgot how God radically saved you? Have you forgot what God saved you from? That's one of the problems by being saved so long. We forget the goodness of God's grace. We forget the goodness of God's mercy and what he's done for us. Don't ever forget your story. Don't ever forget what God has saved you from and how God rescued you from yourself, from sin and from death. That he is the one is why you have life. Well, Jonah continues to recap God's goodness in verse 5. He says, I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountain. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O oh Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. Come on. <laughs> See, God is letting Jonah have a testimony in his quiet time, in his dark time while he's fasting. When's the last time you fasted? When's the last time you got in the dark so you could be in the presence of God and he can show you you and then you can see who God is? Hey. See, when you have a come to Jesus moment, it's designed to help you see what life without God will look like. Jonah was revisiting the nightmare of his near-death experience. He recognized that it wasn't his own goodness that rescued him, but it was God's grace. God's grace. And as I thought about this story, this is also my story. That I had a come to Jesus moment when I was far, far from God. I had this hardened heart that I was living in willful sin. I was on the run from God. Ignoring all the signs where God was trying to show me to turn from my sins and to turn back from him. And I was, as I was being swallowed up with life without God, it led me to worshiping false gods. See, sometimes we think a false god is some gold ornament. A false god is anything that I put over God. Anything that's outside the will of his word, anything that I'm looking to, to to give me peace, to give me joy, to give me happiness. All the things that the world is trying to offer us. When we put those things in place of God, that is an idol. And we're worshiping those idols. And that's exactly what I was doing. 
that I was giving this world the affections of my heart instead of giving it to the God who saved me. Jonah chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, those who worship false gods turn their back on God's mercies. But Jonah said, but I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. And I will fulfill my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. See, when something or someone has first place in our lives over God, that becomes an idol that makes us lose sight of God's mercies. And what's so great about God's mercy is they're new every morning. See, our sin deserves God's wrath, but God's mercy overrides God's wrath, and he doesn't give us what we deserve. See, there are so many things in this world that tries to get our attention, try to distract us from God and his kingdom agenda, whether it's money, whether it's pleasure, or even worldly success, because we're all subject to the temptations of this world. But Jonah was able to realize the error of his ways. Jonah realized that he was created for the purposes of God. So how dare he disobey God's command? Because God commissioned him to be a prophet and a preacher. That this is what he was born for. As Jonah was going through this come to Jesus moment, he was able to get out of the fog and the darkness of his thinking and out of his hardened heart. That he was able to turn from his sin and get back into the light of God's presence. And so he thanked God. He thanked God for saving his life and giving him the opportunity to be God's prophet. See, Jonah's come to Jesus moment made him do a 180. See, what happens is in life, when we have a mistake, we say, God, I'm sorry, and we keep on walking. But Jonah did a 180. He turned and went the exact opposite direction. How often do we say, whoops, or God, I didn't mean that, only to continue to perpetuate that. God is calling us to do a 180 and turn and go in the other direction back to him. Because Jonah knew that God was his salvation, that God was his life, and he was finally ready to walk in obedience to what God was calling him to do. Jonah 2, verse 10. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. After discipline and correction had been administered, God told the fish to release Jonah at the place that his disobedience occurred, which was Joppa. See, often when we are suffering in negative circumstances, we pray and cry out to God for deliverance. And it appears that God doesn't hear us. Because there is no change. We're still walking in the same direction. See, when we're being disobedient, God won't move until we do. The adverse circumstances that we're in are often allowed by God so he can get our full, undivided attention, like he did with Jonah. God does this because he loves us. God won't allow our change to come until we repent and turn back to him. So my question today is, have you had your come to Jesus moment? I mean, have you had this time where you can remember and think back that you turned away from this life of sin and really embraced Jesus and lived for him? Because I can. In my time of running away from God, God just kept having fish swallow me up in different ways. Everywhere I turned, there was problems. I was in pain. Everything that the world promised would always come to a quick end. It'd be fun for a moment. It'd be pleasing for a second. Next thing you know, I'm in pain and I'm hurting and struggling. And you get to a place that all you can do is look up. Because all these things that's around you are not doing what they promised that they would do. But that was on purpose by God. Because he wanted me to know that he was the answer. It just so happens I get an invitation to church. And the message was about running from God. I couldn't take it. I was weeping from the first verse. And at the end of the message, the pastor says, if you've been running from God, come up front. 
I couldn't get out of my seat fast enough. I didn't even know this till later, but I ran. I ran to the front. I didn't casually walk and just, I came and I'm like, I've been running, I've been running. I'm screaming it out and got prayed for. It was one of the most beautiful moments of my life where I left this world of sin, of pleasure, of what the world says is good and awesome, leaving that behind and embracing the grace and goodness of God. And because I've chosen to stay that course, I've been seeing God take me on a journey that's blown my mind. But God is not a respecter of person. He wouldn't do anything for me that he wouldn't do for you. Amen. So my question for you, are your circumstances of your life unbearable? Do you feel as though that life is swallowing you, you up? Do problems and difficulties seem to be mounting in your life? It's like one thing after another. As soon as this one gets taken care of, there's another one. If so, you may be experiencing God's discipline like Jonah. That if that's you, that seems like wherever you turn, there's hardship. Wherever you turn, there's problems. Wherever you turn, there's issues. God is inviting you to have a come to Jesus moment. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity today to have your come to Jesus moment. See, many times in life when a person gives their life to Jesus, things don't change right away. That they, you know, start coming to church, they start doing some things. It's usually after they go astray. It's usually after the the world has drawn them back out. And then they go through all of these hardships that they realize how much they need God and how they've walked out of the will of God and out of God's presence and out of God's light. That may be you here today. That you have found yourself far, far from God. There's been this slow drift in your life from the sin that you choose to walk into. And that God is saying, it's time to come home that you've been running long enough. He's saying, aren't you tired? I don't like giving you this correction and discipline, but I have to because I have a plan for your life. I have a purpose of why I created you from the beginning. But you must accept and have this come to Jesus moment. And so, As we close this message, I'm going to give you an opportunity that if you've been running from God, that you've been living a life of disobedience, that you notice that, yes, Pastor, when difficult circumstances, adverse situations, that's me. That's me. I lost my job. Then this happened. My car broke down. This happened. All these different things. God is talking. God is saying, stop running. Come back to me. Come back to obedience. That God will be merciful to you. God is waiting to wrap his grace around you. He's ready for the fish to spit you up, to put you back on dry land, to put you back on a firm foundation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. And after I pray, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just come up to the altar as a sign that I've been running. But I'm having my come to Jesus moment now. And God, I'm prepared to recommit my life to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for Jonah and We thank you that you lovingly corrected and disciplined him, Lord, to get his undivided attention. That, God, we thank you that you loved him enough to give him a come-to-Jesus moment. Well, Father, I just pray for those who are here 
I pray, God, that you would speak to their heart, that they would, in this moment, Lord, not harden their hearts to you for giving them a come to Jesus moment. That, God, that they would not care who's around, not care who's watching them, but, God, they want you. And they will come to this altar and recommit their lives to you. And, God, if there's anyone here who has never given their life to you, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would come to the God who sent his only son to die for their sins. So, God, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you move into the hearts of those that you're drawing. And, God, that they would be obedient. The Holy Spirit, as you're calling them to, to stand to their feet and to come forward, God, that they won't, that they would come. So, Father, we thank you right now. We give you the praise and glory and honor for the story of Jonah. And we thank you, God, for showing us the depths of your love and the depths of your pursuit of your children, God, who run away. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.